Hello everyone, my name is Rupa and Nicola is somewhere in the crowd and we both uh, together we work uh, on the Linux bridge at Cumulus Networks. I am completely aware that I am standing in between you and lunch, uh, so I, yeah, but I tend to speak fast and faster than David Ahern, so I will, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I do want to set some context on this because I might lose the, lose attention. So. We work at, uh, at Cumulus, we uh, build a Linux distribution on the switch. So whatever I'm going to talk about runs on the switch and not on the host. So that's a difference. And this is a scale of problems that we face, which unfortunately cannot be solved by BPF or uh, eBPF. It's uh, some operational challenges. And as you can imagine, on a switch, you're running a lot of protocols. A switch, uh, this is a hardware accelerated switch. So we get the line rate uh, routing and line rate, line rate forwarding in hardware. But there is a ton of protocols that run on the system itself, on the switch itself, to make sure every bridge entry or every uh, routing entry is there at the right time so that there is no loss in uh, network. Uh, sorry about that. So, A forwarding entry. Uh, it's a MAC and a MAC and VLAN in most cases, and it points to a DEST port. It resolves to a DEST port. Similar to a FIB lookup, a bridge will do look up a MAC before it forwards the frame. And in in the bridging case, the what you don't what you want to avoid is flooding. So it's very critical that every MAC gets into the bridge at the right time. And the bridge, when you extend it with network virtualization, like something like VXLAN, you can bridge larger domains. And there are a ton of RFCs these days, and people use them in data centers uh, to bridge layer two domains across racks and sometimes across data centers as well. So in, um, yeah, this picture zooms in actually. This is, there, these are two switches connected by an uh, VXLAN overlay. And um, VXLAN, is a bridge port. And VXLAN actually connects to the other switch, um, FDB entries on the other switch via the overlay. So L3 is involved, but L3 is involved over the VXLAN. So where does the scale come from on the bridge? It's, like I said, it's larger layer two domains. You're uh, bridging, there is a picture here. So these are racks connected, the green ones are switches. Basically, you're collect, connecting many hosts in multiple racks, and these racks are in pods, and then you use spine switches to actually connect all of them together. And this can span data centers as well. So bridging on the switch is accelerated by hardware, and hardware learns at line rate. Um, and uh, so the hardware actually supports 100K entries, 100K or more, but um, obviously in software we can uh, bridge FDB, Linux Bridge FDB actually can handle millions of entries. But on this, on these switches, the hardware is capable of that much, and the CPU is uh, low-end CPU. It has to just learn and populate, carry these FDB entries in the database. So flooding. Flooding is also in hardware. Flooding occurs in hardware, and sometimes if hardware cannot handle the packet, it's going to uh, punt it to CPU, and CPU needs to handle flooding as well. So the goal is to reduce flooding. There are other, other things that the bridge does, IGMP snooping and optimized multicast forwarding. All these are learning techniques to actually stop flooding of multicast and broadcast traffic across the, uh, across the data center. Multi-homing, uh, I did describe in my uh, abstract as well that multi-homing is something that I'm gonna focus on because something that uh, every bridge problem needs a separate solution for. So the parameters here are learning, uh, bridge learning at scale, how fast you uh, learn max. And uh, if you think about it, these max are nothing but your hosts and VMs and containers that are coming and going. 
adding and deleting and updating FDB entries, reducing flooding, even multicast, reducing multicast flooding, um, network conver convergence on link failures, how fast can you, if a rack goes, goes down, how fast you can move the max uh, of that rack or servers to another uh, uh, bridge domain. And Mac moves. Mac moves is another uh, very weird and critical piece where your VM moves from one rack to the other or one pod to the other. And uh, these uh, data center switches, they have longer timers for FDBs and NA entries to time out. And you don't, want, uh, you don't want that long a period of black holing. So what you do is control plane comes in and it has to proactively remove or clean up these entries. So let's talk about multi-homing for a bit. So if uh, I have a picture somewhere, but multi-homing uh, from the host side, you know that there is, uh, you bond NICs and you connect to two switches. That's how it's usually deployed. But there is a critical piece of software that runs on switches. Let's just call these as cluster of switches running Linux. They maintain distributed network states about all the hosts they are providing multi-homing uh, paths to. So what it means is if your one link to one switch goes down, the other switch needs to trans, uh, move all the traffic or redirect all the traffic to the other switch. And that's the, um, that's the solution that these multi-homing uh, multi uh, software provides. And it's usually a proprietary protocol. Um, if um, Cisco, Juniper, all these uh, companies, they have their own implementation of this protocol. I'll talk later in the slides that this is being standardized right now with BGP and eVPN. Um, so again, common functions, redundant paths to multi-home endpoints, faster network convergence, and you maintain, these switches maintain distributed state. Actually, they sync state between, they keep mirrors of the same database so that if one switch goes down or one link goes down, your host still has connectivity. So now this is just a picture showing you the same thing. Uh, this is a typical setup. You have a peer link. It's again a bond or a single port connected between the switches. Uh, hosts are connected to both switches. And typically, like I said, uh, these are non-standard multi-homing control plane protocols that uh, all these, the industry has been uh, seeing for decades actually. Now zooming into this a little bit, you have a, a bridge the peer link that is connects the switches is also part of the bridge. It's the same uh, domain. So your FTB entries that you learn, FTB entries are bridge forwarding entries, which are nothing but host MAC entries. So you have them initially pointing to your host port. But now say the host port or the link, the ETH0 to SWP1 on switch one goes down, it has to, something has to tell the switches that okay, this link has gone down and now if any traffic to that Mac needs to travel via the peer link to the host. And once the link is restored, you want to move that uh, traffic back again. So network convergence during failures. Um, so these multi-homing protocols, Control Plane actually programs these FTBs. Today, uh, we run Linux on our switches and uh, there is a control daemon that has to remove all these FTB entries and replace them. And again, when the link comes back, uh, restore them. So this results in too many FTB updates, too many Netlink notifications, and we have other protocols also listening to these notifications, which uh, affects convergence. Actually, you will see all of these, uh, any networking event having all these uh, pro uh, daemons actually running at high uh, CPU, trying to converge. So how do you avoid this or how do you make it easier? So some of the work we've done recently is uh, to, so if you think about it, this peer link is a static configuration that is provisioned when you provision a switch. So if something is static and you know that this is the backup port for any, um, any link down events or any FTB that initial dust port goes, goes down, so, there is a patch that I uh, point to here at the end in the references section. Basically, it allows you to provide a backup port for a bridge port. So, and in a way, this is, this is done generically, but in a way, it is teaching the bridge driver to understand multi-homed uh, interfaces or multi-homed uh, endpoints. 
and the bridge, see, uh, before the bridge forwards, that when it does a bridge lookup, if it sees that the link is down on the dust port, it's going to seamlessly find, try to redirect the traffic through the peer link port. So this, is, this has been a great, uh, it helps in convergence a lot. Future announcements, so there is a request to actually uh, carry some of this backup port as active indication in the FTP dumps because people don't know uh, whether the traffic is go going through the peer link. That's something uh, we do plan to provide a patch. Now, network overlays. So this is the next generation of multi-homing. Uh, what, what I just talked about, static peer link and all that was yesterday. Well, we do still support and debug many issues related to that, but uh, next generation is network overlays. What does this mean? So if you see the picture, the peer link is disappeared. And what the backup link becomes the overlay. Uh, well, performance, other performance challenges with the overlay being the backup link are yet to be determined because all the industry is coming up with solutions of multi-homing with network overlays and we'll see. And there's a lot of standards coming out also to improve uh, convergence and to improve uh, the protocols in this area. So again, uh, this is a standards-based protocol. There is an RFC. Uh, it's BGP is used as a protocol. So all proprietary control plane multi-homing protocols go away. It's BGP, and it, has, it can now exchange MACs. As you know, BGP is the protocol of the internet. It, is, it does routes, and now it's doing MACs as well. And it listens to bridge FTP updates. One of the implementations uh, here is FRR, the free range routing suite, which has uh, EVPN support, listening to bridge events, and so on. And it is soon uh, looking at actually multi homing. So, what it means now is um, so, going back to the VXLAN FTP entry, VXLAN FTP entry is nothing but a MAC pointing to a set of remote destinations or remote uh, VXLAN endpoints. So if you look at this picture, or rather this picture, so you have, and also another point here is, you, in this, the RFC says you can have multiple um, switches or an endpoint can be multi-home to multiple switches and not just two. So this provides, this brings in more interesting challenges. Now, you can also do ECMP that you, you can share the load, multi-home load across because it's L3 underneath. You can um, share the load between multiple, multiple switches. It, it is just not active backup, but you can also share load. This is a zoomed in picture, same thing. Hosts are now connected to two links or two switches or three switches, any combination of switches. So you have multiple paths. And you can see VXLAN zero, the peer link is gone and VXLAN zero becomes, takes place of the peer link. And all your switch uh, peer link traffic actually goes over the network. So the RFC actually brings in a lot of, um, talks a lot about a uh, few technologies that you can deploy in the control plane. So I, have, I am not going to go into the details, but they are here just for reference. Uh, it's also mentioned a little bit in detail in the paper. Um, so these are control plane uh, ways to deal with how do you not loop a packet or how do you avoid duplicate packets? Uh, between these switches. Now you can see there are three switches that are forwarding traffic, right? And you don't want, uh, you want one of them to be the designated forwarder for a particular uh, ESI. It's called an ESI or a multi homed endpoint, like a bond ID for each uh, bond or each endpoint. Now to allow for or to help the control plane convergence uh, a, a challenges, or solutions, to implement those solutions. One thing is the backup port again comes to the rescue. Instead of the backup port being the peer link, it is now the VXLAN port. It goes over the overlay. That fits in easily here. Um, that, um, and then there is another requirement, MAC desk groups. VXLAN FTB or MAC entries are nothing but MACs pointing to remote VXLAN tunnels. In this picture, what it means that is a MAC on uh, switch one can point to switch two and switch three, 
and switch 2 and switch 3 are redundant paths to say host 1. All three are redundant paths. Now if switch 1 is the designated forwarder, he needs to forward traffic to switch 2 and switch 3 and it, he can also load balance the traffic. So for this, we think that treating these MAC entries or FTP entries like routes will help and having uh, the, some of the recent work that uh, David Ayan has been doing in the route API, the ability to update just the DEST groups or ECMP groups. It's, it's the same, uh, I put a reference to that, it's the same, um, same problem or the same solution to the problem. Um, basically, you allow the DEST groups or a remote, a remote endpoints to be in, uh, updated independent of the max. That will allow control plane to actually uh, update only a few groups and not have to deal with hundreds and thousands of Macs. So a picture describing this, uh, VXLAN, if anybody has played with VXLAN FDB entries, it is nothing but a Mac VNI and it has a list of uh, remote endpoints that you can, and the default behavior is to actually replicate a packet uh, to all these endpoints. And now this is mostly used today in case of broadcast flooding. That is when you know a Mac does not belong on a particular VTAP, you, it hits a default entry in the FTP database and it's going to replicate to all endpoints. Basically, that's broadcasting to over the VXLAN fabric. The proposal here is changes to the FTP API, obviously not changing the existing API. The existing API will remain. It's similar to the route API changes that David Ayan has been talking. Basically, your FTP entry points to a desk group ID, and the desk, you maintain a separate desk group database, which control plane can update uh, at a faster rate. There are some details about Netlink attribute and um, yeah, how this desk group looks, but it's similar to how routes, ECMP group is nothing but um, a set of next stops and devices. In this case, you map that exactly to VXLAN endpoints. It is nothing but an IP address and um, VNI. Yeah, and I'm still trying to convince myself if I can use and convince David Ahern maybe can, we can, if we can use the next stop API for this so that we don't have to uh, add more Netlink attributes. Yeah, I just wanted to thank a few more people who I work with and who um, are involved in developing the control plane. Multi-homing solutions are not an easy, uh, easy piece of software. It's, yeah, it, it's a hair-pulling exercise trying to develop this. So I just wanted to thank a few more people. And I have a few references here about on the RFCs where all this is mentioned. And um, it's a good trend, though. Everybody is picking up. Multi-homing solutions have never ha been an open uh, implementation. So it's nice to see a Linux. It will be nice, too. It's still in the works. But it will be nice to see a Linux implementation of uh, eVPN-based, BGP-based multi-homing solution. That's all I had. Anyone have any questions about the uh, bridging stuff? Oh. Uh, hi. Um, uh, sorry if I've missed something, but uh, I just wanted to understand, like, how do you avoid loops? Because you can have a redundant paths, uh, like the diagram which you showed, right? So um, if the uh, forwarding has to happen between the source and the destination, then basically you can have, say, in a simple diagram which you showed, you could have three paths from a single switch, right? So in that case, generally, like the companies like Juniper or Cisco have, they, they have got their own proprietary algorithms that, which run at the control plane and generally uses ISIS, ISIS kind of uh, uh, protocols to basically avoid loops. So we cannot have a STP running in a data center, right? So uh, how exactly the protocol over here is basically avoiding that? So the control plane has, uh, has um Guard, uh, guards against this, right? For example, it so the control plane on every switch knows which port is multi-homed, and that's where the designated forwarder comes in, where it knows that if it's getting it on a singly connected endpoint, then it's going to forward. If it knows that it is not, it also maintains a list of which 
uh, no, this is again the distributed state that they exchange, which uh, switch it's connected to. So it's only going to forward to a switch that is not um, a part of that. So is the uh, protocol uh, which is basically distributed, and um, it's um, the information is uh, about the max and the destination is getting exchanged using that basically, and that's making sure that there's a single tree topology kind of thing which is maintained, right? Yes. Okay, sure. Yeah. Thanks. So they, they keep state uh, which if the endpoint is dually connected or multiple connected or single connected. So there is a lot of uh, state that is maintained. Uh, there's a follow-up question to this. Like, do you have a weighted concepts of the path? So you can have ECMP kind of thing, but you can also assign the weights. Please, yes. Please, please talk into the Sorry. path. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the weights, yes. yeah. Can you have the weights as yeah. well assigned to it, the links? It will. So when we evolve this API, it's going to be exactly similar to routes. You can oh, okay. have an equal cost or uh, weighted. All right, so sure. both will be supported. Sure, sure, thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Here you go. Um, now that you are falling back to a tunnel, how do you handle MDU? Because the switch part probably has one MDU, like 1,500, and the overlay will consume some of it. Yes, and actually MTU is in the data center, it's all handled via config. So you make sure that it is configured properly. For example, we, when we are running VXLAN, our VXLAN endpoints have 9,000 MTU set. And then the interfaces itself is 1,500 or it can go. And the VXLAN driver also adjusts the MTU, right? It uh, has a 50 byte buffer. Uh, when you're setting MTU on the VXLAN, it accounts for that. So. <laughs> okay, so if I correctly propose to to uh, split the VXLAN forwarding database into two tables, so we get another lookup into table in VXLAN fast path. I mean, VXLAN is not exactly the fastest protocol ever, uh, <laughs> but still, yeah. this will slow it down even more, right? Yeah, the thing is, the, the packet lookups does not affect me because I am on the switch and it's all, once you program it into hardware, it's all hardware accelerated. But uh, it's a good question. I mean, there are two lookups in the bridge and you're talking about the VXLAN lookup as well, right? Yeah. So, it's yeah. It's all but similar to how David did the routes. And yeah, the exactly. Entries, so I think it's not an intractable problem from the beginning. So it's definitely something to look into for the software path. Yeah. Cool. Definitely. All right, thank you very much, Rupa. Thank you.